Hey everybody, my name is Bobby. Welcome to Mile High Church. Thank you so much for spending a part of your weekend with us, especially if you're new. Our vision, oneness revealed, a world of love, peace, and abundance for all. Our mission, to serve as a spiritual beacon for personal empowerment and global enlightenment. Before we get started today, we wanna to give you a look at a few things coming up around Mile High Church for you and your family. If you're in need of extra support this holiday season, navigating the holidays after loss is this Saturday. This is our grief support workshop that can help you find meaning and solace after a profound loss. Also this Saturday is Sacred Saturday with Jackie Harris. The topic is self-love leads to compassion. You will learn to increase self-love, compassion, and motivation for yourself at this semi-silent mini retreat. I am so excited that Mile High Church is returning to having a midweek service on Wednesday nights called Midweek Renewal, an evening of spiritual practice. There'll be a message from a minister, some devotional music, a prayer from one of our prayer practitioners, but the service itself is really built around spiritual practices, meditation, forgiveness, prayer, these divine tools that we know can uplift and change our lives for the better. We can come together as spiritual community, practice these, live great lives, come back the next week and repeat. I hope to see you there. For more information about anything you've heard today, stop by the event center or connect with us online at milehighchurch.org. My friends, you know, this is uh, one of my favorite congregational songs that we get to sing. It's called One Big Family, because we are. We're all connected. Let's sing this together. Here we go. Everybody, get up on your feet. See the light in everybody you meet. Everybody, get up on your feet. See the light in everybody you meet. Let us be reminded of who we've come to be. We all love, we all want one big family. Hey, 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 yeah, yeah. Tom Litch. Good morning, Mile High Church. So great to see you all here and to see those of you watching online, represented in that camera back there. We're so glad that you're here too. 
Who was with us Friday night for our great Dacker Keltner event? Look at that. Wasn't that, wasn't that a great event? He was amazing and wonderful. One thing he talked about that really resonated for me, Josh, is he talked about the great uh, social, uh, so, socio, well, I can't say that word right now, uh, Emile, Emile Durkheim, who is a, who, a wonderful teacher who talked about collective effervescence. All right, say that three times fast. Yeah, collective effervescence. Collective, I can't do it. Collective effervescence, which means when a group of people gather together for a strong, heartful purpose, he talked about uh, social Sociologist, that's the word. Uh, he talked about music and sports events, go Broncos, and things like that. And spiritual gatherings, we come together, the collective effervescence that empowers all of our hearts. So happy collective effervescence in our spiritual community today. We're so glad you're here for it. And Reverend Josh and I are here together because we've got some in information we want to share with you, some important information about our campus. We do. You know, uh, if you ask me to compare our Mile High campus to something, the closest I can come to is Hogwarts School of yeah. Witchcraft and Wizardry. <laughs> uh, because the, the Mile High Church is like a living organism. Mm -hmm. uh, it creates this sacred energy for us on this campus and is filled with the legacy of the spirit of so many people who've contributed so much to this place. And we have some, some news about our campus and an invitation to share with you uh, this morning. We have these beautiful ash trees all over our campus. You see them express at the height of fall. And we have learned that almost 70 of them are infested with the ash borer beetle. And so the city is requiring us to remove these trees from our campus, which is very sad uh, because they've meant so very much to us. So the week of November 18th, um, these trees are going to be removed, and um, we are so grateful to Dr. Patty and our Sacred Earth Ministry. Uh, they're preparing a ceremony to bless each and every tree uh, before it is removed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're extending an invitation, too, because we would love your support in helping us to remove and replant um, beautiful trees on our Mile High campus. So the way that this is working for us, we're very grateful always to our Mile High Church Foundation, our long-term savings uh, account, and the foundation board has gathered together, and they are going to sponsor half of the cost of this process of removal and replanting, which is $25,000 in a matching donation to the community. So they are gifting us that $25,000, and we are asking you today, if you are willing to help us to meet that second half with donating the cost of this process in, in the amount of $350 to remove and replant the trees. And this is a giving above and beyond your normal giving in a way that we can re-beautify re our community, our beautiful grounds together. And so Josh and a number of the foundation members will be out in the lobby today after service. If you would like to participate in this, you can also go to our website and make that contribution. Do we have any of the Mile High Church Foundation board members here today. I think I saw some of them. There's Paula Ken. right there. There's Ken. Thank you so much to our Mile High Church Foundation. We're so blessed by you. And we thank you. Thank you so much for helping us with this process and contributing so generously. Yeah, it was so wonderful. Even after the, this probably isn't good fundraising, but after the first service, almost 40 mile hires came and sponsored a tree. We only need 72 yeah. to complete this project. So it just uh, tells how wonderful people ta take care of this community. And I hope to see some of you after service in the lobby. Yeah. Go give Josh your money. <laughs> And so with that, we also now step into a time of doing spiritual practice together. It's a joy to do community practice. We're going to sing together, enter the silence, and Reverend Carol will lead us in a prayer. Let us begin. Surely the presence of God is in this place I can feel the mighty power 
and the grace I can hear the brush of angel wings I see glory on each face Surely the presence of God is in this place. Surely the presence of God is in this place. I can How wonderful it is to just take a moment in this silence and this stillness to come together in prayer, to recognize that powerful presence of the divine that we see in the early morning light, this beautiful fall day and the changing of the leaves and the transformation of the trees on our campus. Just absolutely recognizing the hand of God is everywhere. And we allow that recognition to just bloom inside of each and every one of us. Remembering the divine truth of who we are and recognizing that there is this divine orchestra and each and every one of us are instruments so important, so critical, so unique, all our talents and gifts, so important to this world. And that without each and every one of us, the universe's song would be incomplete. And so I just celebrate that this morning, celebrate all the beautiful lights in the sanctuary watching online, all who are a part of this amazing Mile High community knowing that we come together in that spiritual sense of knowing and practicing peace and goodwill and compassion and kindness, knowing that that peace starts within us and then, then from us we extend peace and love into the world. And bit by bit, we can make powerful and important changes. And so this morning I am grateful. I'm grateful for Dr. Michelle and her amazing, powerful message, knowing that it comforts us, it uplifts us, and it reminds us that we are always surrounded by the presence of the divine in every single moment. And so with great thanksgiving and gratitude, I simply release these words and these truths into that amazing alchemy of love and law, knowing that all is well, because all is God, and so it is.
face But my soul is light I am 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 light And our inspirational words today support our enlightened citizenry topic today. From Margaret Mead, a small group of thoughtful people could change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And from Harriet Tubman, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. And from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the great liabilities of history is that all too many people fail to remain awake through great periods of social change. Every society has its protectors of status quo, and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolutions. Today our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change.
Thank you so much, our music director, Mr. Tom Litch. Beautiful job. And our band, we've got Bijou and Mike, Stu and Rob here today. Thank you, gentlemen. Well done. And I'd like to acknowledge Carrie for taking you up on the invitation for the dance break. Good job, Carrie. Loved your dancing. <laughs> oh, it's a wonderful morning here at Mile High. I'm very grateful to be here. Before I start, I want to invite your consideration to join me next Sunday. I'm going to be facilitating our new members class. New members class is a great class for anybody who's fairly new to our community and would like to learn more about who we are, what we do, and how things work around here. Anyone is welcome to come in and there's no pressure to become a member. And for many of us, this community has become our spiritual home and we want to express that by joining formally and becoming a member. And so if that's of interest to you, you're also welcome to come to the class. As you can see by the slide, there's an in-person class next Sunday at 1130 over in the Vote Chapel. And then we'll have an online class on Monday night. You can pick one or the other. We'd like you to register for the online class so we know that you'll be with us. But if you'd like to come to the in-person class, you're more than welcome just to show up. So I'm looking forward to seeing many of you there. So today, we are, as Reverend Jackie mentioned, talking about enlightened citizenry. This is a phrase that I just out and out stole from Dr. Roger Teal. He, he would talk about this a lot and he, during his ministry here. And I just thought it was such a powerful, powerful concept that I've spent a lot of time wondering what does it really mean to be an enlightened citizen? And I've heard some rumors that there's something going on Tuesday here in the U.S. that maybe we should uh, give some thought to being a little more of an enlightened citizen for. And not only for what we're about to do in terms of voting, and many of us have already voted, but if you're going to go stand in line and vote, or we're going to watch the outcome of that in the, the weeks and days and years ahead, it seems like it would behoove us to become an enlightened citizen, not only for the sake of our United States of America, but for the sake of the entire world. So to start out the conversation, I began exploring a little bit about the word enlightened. What does enlightened mean? I'd known it mostly through spiritual circles. There's also an, an element of the word enlightened that's defined by being modernized or the latest and greatest, meaning it's the enlightened version of our staff policies and that sort of thing. But in our world, in this spiritual realm and in the realm we're talking around, our own consciousness and our awareness of our world, I believe that enlightenment is all about spiritual awakening. It's about bringing light literally the word light in the middle of that, light to the way we show up on this planet as, as a citizen. The things we say and do in our own minds, in our own beingness, as well as what we say to other people and how we behave towards other people. And enlightened citizenry is about bringing our spiritual values and mores to bear upon our activities as a citizen on planet Earth. And it's an important choice because an unenlightened citizenry creates darkness and more violence and more of what I think we don't want. And so I do believe that part of how we can be a healing presence on this planet is to ask ourselves and to consider, how am I being an enlightened citizen right now? And how am I not? And so it's important for us to consider this. And I started out this exploration for this particular talk a number of weeks ago with our wonderful videographer, Bobby, whom you saw in the announcements, asking people out on the plaza, I call it my person on the plaza interviews, uh, what do people here think it means to be an enlightened citizen? So we have a brief video to show you about their answers. Let's start with them. What does it mean to be an enlightened citizen? To me, it's to think as a universal citizen. So not just your own personal desires, but what's for the good of the all. And that means animal, vegetable, mineral kingdom, the entire planet, everyone, everywhere. Um, of course, we all have our own wishes and wants, but to really try to choose what is best for all, for the highest good of all, and then to follow that and to not get entangled in right and wrong and to try to be a peaceful citizen when you make your choices. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. Putting your, yourself in the shoes of other people and realizing that it's okay to have differences and that we embrace our differences. What does it mean to you to be an enlightened citizen? I think to me it means to be open, to be looking at all viewpoints and hearing what everybody has to say because maybe they're going to teach me something I didn't know and it might alter my view. Mm. I believe an enlightened citizen is one who's able to consider the needs and, and interests of others that they're living in society with. An enlightened citizen is being happy, being kind, helping other people. I think it means to know who you are and your truth and to just come from that point mm -hmm. in how you live. Um, I think an enlightened citizen is probably a good person that has a bright soul and loves things. For the equity and inclusion of our society and the fairness to all. Well, for me, being an enlightened citizen is leading with compassion and holding a higher vision than current events and circumstances and working toward that vision with compassion and goodwill. A person who looks not only outward, but inward. Well, I believe that we all stand for humanity. And within that, we, we have to move for the most benevolent outcome mm. for all people. An enlightened citizen would be a citizen that looks toward the light. You be responsible, you have empathy, you... <laughs> uh... Tell me what it means to you to be an enlightened citizen. I think an enlightened citizen is someone who is curious, curious about other people and about uh, the whys and hows of things, and also someone who is compassionate mm -hmm. and want, wanting to lean into understanding. Basically, that means to shine my light. Enlightened citizens. To me, it means really paying attention to what other people are going through, not reacting to what they say to me, but really filling into what they're experiencing and try to, trying to relate to them that way. Beautiful. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> Wonderful job. Such wisdom here, huh? And we had a lot more interviews than that. We could have... Th that's my talk. I'm done now. Let's take the offering. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we could have really, uh, people were very wise and articulate. And honestly, in all of the ones that we included and the ones that we didn't include, I would say the number one word that was spoken when it came to what it means is compassion. Compassion and love. And I also think it was a lot about paying attention to other people, listening, being respectful, being kind, a lot of those kind of words. So what does it take to do that? How can we do that? How can each one of us embody more of that? And I, I, I believe that in order to do that, each one of us has something we likely need to change about the way we think or the way we approach the world at large. And change is a powerful word. It was beautifully expressed in, in the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's quote that Reverend Jackie read, that change, we have to be prepared for change. And then you take change, and I think if you go further, uh, maybe a little bit, more profound word that we might consider than, well, I've got to change is I've got to transform. We've got to transform our systems and we've got to transform the way we approach things and we've got to transform this. That's a powerful word too. Transformation is a powerful, powerful word. And then as I was contemplating this, it felt to me like a, a little bit of a higher vibrational energy beyond changing and transforming was transmutation, transmuting. Now I played with that word transmute and transmutation is often most associated with alchemy, with what alchemists were trying to do as they were wanting to change metal to gold, to transform something from one substance to another substance, to really in the life of spiritual seekers, um, transmutation is about going from our lower nature, which might include 
pursued selfishness and ruthlessness and egotism and only looking out for me and transmuting my energy to, as some of our, our folks said in the video, maintaining my preferences and acting on those preferences, yet having profound compassion and extending great freedom and respect to all citizens everywhere, to all beings everywhere, no matter what's going on for them. That word is often used by not only alchemists, but mystics and spiritual greats who are seeking to teach humanity how to live from a higher place, to transmute ourselves. And love was also mentioned in our video. Most alchemists or people who are practicing spiritual alchemy believe that love and compassion is the highest state of the transmutation energy. That we can, no matter what someone is doing, how they're behaving, we can still, if we choose to, extend ourselves to them in love and compassion. We may not agree with them, and that's fine. We may not even like them personally, and that's fine. But we can extend ourselves in absolute love and transmute ourselves and the whole atmosphere of our planet by doing that. This is what we talk about and teach about here in our community, and it is the most important, profound, and challenging practice of being a spiritual person, of being a human being, of being a citizen on this planet Earth. And yet I think we're all being called to it. And how we know we're being called to it is that we can see the things going on in the world, not only in our country, but around the world that are challenging. And we wonder what to do. And we wonder if this is enough, but this is the work. This alchemy is the work. This transmutation is the work. Because I, what I know for sure is that if we continue to be focused on what we don't want, and some of us are very passionate about what we don't want, aren't we? <laughs> that passion is very creative. One of the basic teachings here in our community is if we focus on what we don't want, we just get more of the same. And part of the reason that's true is because many times we are much more animated, passionate, and energized about what we don't want than what we do want. This invites us to put as much passion through the activity of transmutation into what we do want and to move ourselves and facilitate ourselves forward in that energy. And so I want to focus on two areas of transmutation this morning. The first one is transmuting confusion to clarity. Part of what is challenging for us, whether we're in an election cycle or we're watching the news happen, is that there can be great confusion and we can feel confounded by what we're seeing and hearing. And so clarity, transmuting that confusion, is a huge part of the spiritual practice of becoming an enlightened citizen. I know that uh, I have felt in this election cycle so confused at times, and I watch uh, morning news on some weekdays just to get a sense of what's going on in the world, and I've watched the commercials, and there'll be a commercial that says, this candidate is a saint because they've done all this stuff, and then right after that, in the next 30 seconds, a, a commercial, this candidate is a horrible, evil doer, and you should never vote for them. What's true? How do I know what's true? Do I know what's true by watching television? No, no. No, no. but a lot of that marketing machine, not only about the election cycle, but about the world at large, is about activating our lizard brain making us afraid, to be afraid of that candidate. They did this, and I heard it on television, or I saw it on social media. Oh my gosh, can you believe that? And all the while, the clar there may be clarity about none of that's even true. But we're being supported always if we pay too much attention 
to being confused and afraid and led into a state of being. I feel like I've fallen into holes sometimes when I go on to social media. I'll fall into some hole of someone's comment and then looking at the comments and I'm in this hole and before I know it, it's a dark hole and it is horrible and I, I just want out. I felt like it's a horrible tennis match that I've been watching for a year and a half. Boop, 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 boop. And on both sides, if you will, here in the U.S., at times, boop, ah, boop, ah. (laughs) What are they doing over there? It's crazy. It can be crazy making. How do I transmute that confusion that I might feel into clarity that's in alignment with my values, in alignment with my preferences? I can't stay in confusion and have that experience. I've got to facilitate myself out of it. I remembered a piece that we used to have in one of our classes years ago that I suspect many of you have probably heard before, but I want to presence this to it because this feels kind of the process for me of facilitating myself out of confusion into clarity, that transmutation process. It's called an autobiography in five short chapters by Portia Nelson. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Anybody else relate to that? I've done that before. Yeah. Chapter two. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I still don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. These two chapters to me represent a lack of clarity about my responsibility in my own life, about my energy, my accountability for how I show up in the world. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. It is my fault. I know where I am. I get out immediately. There's where it starts to click. There's where something new begins to happen. Oh, I've fallen down this. I've taken myself down this rabbit hole. It's my fault. I can get out. Chapter four. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. (laughs) To transmute ourselves from confusion to clarity means we have to walk down different streets. You could equate that to walk down different synapses of our brain to take ourselves and facilitate ourselves down different ways. To say to ourselves, I choose to be an enlightened citizen. I choose to be a contribution of good on this planet. And that means I gotta walk down different streets. I can no longer choose to walk down the streets where I spend a lot of time in upset and making people wrong and criticism. And spiritual clarity, which I transmute myself to, still comes with it, my preferences, my choices, my way of voting, my preferences for there to be more peace on the planet, my preferences for certain policies and people. It's not like we, get a, we, we just get rid of that stuff. That's important. But how I express those preferences is with great peace, not such, such anger and frustration. Years ago, we had a wonderful teacher named Ken Kyes come to Mile High Church. And I thought he was so transformational. He's no longer on the planet. He made his transition. But he brought to us beautiful work about understanding that when we're walking through this life, an enlightened person absolutely has their preferences. But they don't feel a need to project their preferences onto another person. He would say, happiness happens when your consciousness is not dominated by addictions and demands, and you experience life as a parade of preferences. It's the willingness to have my preferences. 
See, sometimes I think we spiritual people, I've said this before and I will say it again, we fall into the trap of believing that oneness means that everybody has to have the same preferences. And that simply is not true. Oneness is not sameness. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, would say this. Spiritual teachers throughout the ages have said this. It's easy for me to hang out and be only with people that I agree with and that I feel one with. Advanced spiritual studies is to hang out with people I disagree with and love them and have compassion and respect for them. Spiritual advanced studies is even, here we go, take a deep breath with me, the candidate that you hope doesn't win next week to send them love and compassion. Have I got you still here with me? (laughs) That's advanced spirituality. It's to not wish harm for anyone. It's to not wish a lack of good for anyone, no matter what they've done. But to stand in that spiritual depth of trust and love and clarity about my own values and my own life and to exercise that with great love and to walk forward in that while holding all beings in love and compassion. That's true spiritual clarity to me. And hand in hand with that comes the second transmutation that I think is the most important. It's transmuting fear into faith. Fear into faith. Fear argues is that if, if we don't want what happens to happen the world's going to fall apart. If the thing that happens that we don't want to have happen happens, we're all dead. The world is going to end. Our freedoms are going to end. People are going to die. And and I understand that with this, this world structure happening, the stakes are high and, and there's challenges before us and great challenges ahead of us. And transmuting ourselves to a faith way of living, though, says we can survive and thrive no matter what. And indeed, faith actually can have some place where it can look back and say, hey, as a country, as a world, it's not like we've never been through crisis before, is it? It's not like bad things haven't happened before. We've had global wars, we've had uh, terrorism, we've had uh, challenges with pandemics, we've had times where different countries were at odds with each other and we've been at odds. We have been through lots and while it hasn't always been easy or pretty or uh, beautiful, it is all a part of the evolutionary journey of humanity and faith lands squarely in that pocket and says, I may not understand, and yet I choose to continue to be a being of faith and do my part to keep people In that space of love and compassion, I don't allow my fears to take over and have me be a contribution constantly of fear and anxiety. Rather, I choose to do my practice and to be centered and to trust the journey that I'm on and that we're on together, that I stand for faith and love and compassion, not only in my head, but how I live it out. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, in his final message called Sermon by the Sea at our Asilomar conference in 1959 said these words, it would be wonderful indeed if a group of persons should arrive on earth who were for something and against nothing. This would be the sum mum bonum of human organization, wouldn't it? It is in the life of the individual. Now, I've been quoting that quote for years, and I never looked up sum mum bonum before now. I totally admit it. This time I was like, what the hell is sum mum bonum? It means the highest good, especially the ultimate goal according to which values and priorities are established in an ethical system. 
And the key thing that he stands for, as have spiritual leaders, Jesus included, as he was facing the, the, the civil unrest he was in, it was all about being for something and against nothing. It was all about being for love and not hate. It was all about the great Dr. Martin Luther King being for peace and nonviolence, not hate and retribution. It has always been by the greatest voices calling us to our higher, higher place of profound faith. And this is one of those times. This is one of those moments where we're being called together, not only about our own election, but about everything that's going on in our, on our globe, to be and embody this enlightened citizenry. So I think we do that by transmuting our confusion to clarity, by transmuting our fear into a deeper faith. And a few years ago, I found a practice that I have talked about here before that I want to talk about today that really spoke to me and has made a huge difference. I was going through a period in the last four years where there was a lot of death and destruction in my personal life and my family's personal life. It, it was a very challenging time. And I found myself gravitating towards a book called When Things Fall Apart by the great Buddhist nun Pima Chodron. I think I carried that book with me almost everywhere I went for a while, and I would just take it out and read it when everything got a little overwhelming for me. And there are a lot of sects of Buddhism that talk about uh, the way to enlightenment and to transcend suffering and that sort of thing. And Pima Chodron in this book talks about the notion of being a bodhisattva in the Buddhist teachings. She talks about how many humans in our attempt to feel better will try to push away our suffering or push away the collective suffering so that instead we can grab hold of love and peace and, and somehow pack it into our beingness. She talks, though, about a bodhisattva does the opposite, and many of the Buddhist sects believed that Jesus was a bodhisattva and that Gandhi was a bodhisattva, that these are beings that that word is defined as someone who spends a, a majority of their time seeking to be a beneficial presence to humanity in their actions and in their internal life. That sounds to me a lot like being an enlightened citizen. How can I be a beneficial presence? So becoming a bodhisattva, she says, and this was really profound for me, is that instead you take your highfalutin consciousness and you go down the mountain into the suffering. And you don't have faith in God. This is not about saying God will handle it all. God will make sure the right person is the next president. God will make sure Putin gets his. God, it's not about that. It's about having the faith of God. It's about recognizing that it's not like there's some God out there that's going to fix all this stuff for us. It's that we are the fixers. We are the enlightened citizens who have the ability because the God presence, the transformative life presence that is expressing itself, as Lisa said in the beginning of that video, through all beings and all things and all plants and all animals and all, all humans and all expressions of life is right where we are. And we are not some lost, disempowered beings who can't make a difference. Rather... We are beings who can stand in the midst of whatever's happening, take it into our being, and transform it into love. And so we actually enter into the, the suffering. One of the practices she teaches in this book that we've practiced here before is called Tonglin. It's the practice of literally just being with that which is challenging and breathing it in taking in that suffering, that pain, that anxiety, and feeling and choosing to transmute it with the energy of the divine as us and breathing it back out into the world. It's a practice that, for me, helps me 
be an enlightened citizen. To look at something going on in the world and instead of saying, they got to fix that over there, or who's going to take care of that, or we need to vote that out, or we can't hand that. Oh boy, that must be really tough. I don't disengage from it. I engage in it. The suffering, the pain, the loss, the sadness. And I breathe it in and I transmute it and then I breathe it back. This is the Buddhist practice of Tonglin. And I'm suggesting that we practice this together today and over the next week as we face whatever it is we face together as a way of transmuting our fear, if we have any, or our anxiety into greater faith. So right now I'm going to ask our practitioner prayer partners to stand with me in this practice as they normally do. And we're going to do a couple rounds of Tong Lin. And then I'll do a normal prayer that we're all used to. And after our service, I remind us that all of us can come forward and receive prayer from a practitioner today after the service if you'd like it and need it. And right now, I invite us just to go within and begin to breathe and become centered. To feel all of these words and these ideas and thoughts that are floating in this space that we've experienced together and feel the impact of them and opportunity to open our hearts. No one is forcing us to practice Tonglin, so if you want to say, nope, that's not for me, you are totally at choice. For those who are choosing to join us in this practice, we take a moment right here and right now to begin right where we are. And so we feel into this beautiful space of beings in this room, those watching us online. And we may not know what suffering someone's going through, what broken heartedness may be in someone's life who's in this room right now, what challenges, but what we can know is that wherever human beings gather together, someone is struggling with something. And so we breathe that in, the breath of any suffering of this space, of anyone in this place right now, we just breathe that into our being and we feel that light presence within us begin to immediately transmute it. We even see a light within us. We even imagine that God presence within us, that transformative energy that is moving upon that fear or that suffering or that pain or that sadness and transmuting it to love and light and compassion, and peace. And we breathe it back out. <sighs> Into this room, through that camera, to those watching wherever they are in the world. This is how we begin the practice. And I invite us now to practice Tonglin on any place in the world. Maybe we imagine those who are working in the polls, the pollsters, the, pol the political workers in the next week, or the polls themselves, those who are voting. Or, or maybe we imagine another home where we know there's struggle or challenge or violence, or a country where we're concerned about the people, and we breathe in that energy and we feel that light within us with its great capability to transform that energy. And we feel the transformation occur and the compassion and the love and the peace, the solutions that we may not know of and yet we, we stand in them, divine solutions to challenges and we breathe that back out to that same place, that home, that heart. Oh, what if we simply underestimate the power we have to transform our world, each one of us, this God presence so alive, so profoundly alive in us, calling us to utilize it on behalf of ourselves and all of the beloveds we share this beautiful planet with. So I accept and affirm in this prayerful consciousness that we go forth empowered, enlightened, 
in joy and awareness of our ability to stand in our own light and clarity, to stand in our faith in the days ahead, to stand in the deepest truth of oneness and connection as we look upon, contemplate, and interact with every beautiful thing on this planet in these days ahead. We are enlightened citizens. I claim this, I accept this. And the energy from this moves out onto this planet and surrounds it in love and light. For this is not only for our good that we do this work, this is for the good of all. And we give thanks for our ability to do this as we release this prayer into the action of that universal law, that beautiful alchemy of prayerfulness that transforms these words into manifested reality. Ah. Oh. Transmutation. We let it go, we let it be, and so it is. Amen. Gratitude before me, gratitude behind me, gratitude to the left of me, gratitude to the right of me, gratitude above me. Gratitude below me, gratitude within me, gratitude all around me, and I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful, yes I'm so Thank you, Tom. Beautiful song to lead us in our first offering for November, a month here in the U.S. dedicated to Thanksgiving and gratitude. So we're grateful for our 340-ish uh, viewers online today from Oregon, Massachusetts, Arvada, Delta, Colorado, Florida, Oklahoma, Nevada, Montana, Indiana, New Mexico, Philippines, Spain, and Germany. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're glad you're here. Yes. And I invite us now to give thanks in whatever way as we, as we choose. If you choose to circulate your good today through tithes and offerings, and even if it's not your day to give, to give thanks as we do this act together for some good here at Mile High Church, something that has blessed you, a class, a person, a minister, a practitioner, some activity, a service, some piece of music, an artist, whatever it might be, just spend this time with us giving gratitude for the good that is all around us right here and right now as we share our tithes and offerings. Let's say our affirmation together. So please say with me, divine love as me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, and all that I circulate. And so it is. Sometimes I forget
Thank you to Tom and the band. That is a great reminder. Just remember that. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. And thank you all for being here today. And uh, what a great message. Thanks. Thank you. Such a reminder. And if you are new to Mile High or just have not checked out our Welcome Center, please come by. I'll be there today. We have a gift to give you. In it is a 10% discount at our store. And it also will tell you everything you need to know about Mile High. And we have some great volunteers there also. For those of you online, I encourage you to go online and where it says, I'm new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and go to our website and it'll give you more information. Our practitioner prayer partners are down front. Please come and get a prayer, as Dr. Michelle mentioned. Uh, even if you want more good in yeah. your life, please come down and get a prayer. And for those of you online, you can do an online prayer request that will be prayed over all week. Thank you, Jackie. And the food drive continues. Next week is the final week as we support our wonderful uh, partners uh, in the Action Center here in Lakewood and provide uh, food for them and their families through the holidays. So you can bring food and you can find out the list of things that are most needed uh, out there in the lobby and stop and talk to the volunteers and leave your goods there for us. Thanks so much for participating. And we've got some other great things happening. Who's first? Go ahead. Yes, it's Saturday. I personally invite you, the bereavement team, if you have lost a loved one this past year, to come. It's uh, from 9 to 12, Navigating the Holidays. It's a heartfelt, wonderful support piece. Our classes start this week. We have a couple of classes. Reverend Josh has one starting online on Thursday. You can join him for the Art of Living and a Journey with Joseph Campbell and the teachings. And also I have Tibetan Buddhism. On this Tuesday night, we begin in person in the community center, and we're going to continue some of those beautiful practices that Dr. Michelle um, so lovely presented with us and guided us in this morning. So I hope to see you there. Wonderful. And we are a teaching that isn't just about sitting and listening, but taking action, yeah? So after that wonderful message today, we have an opportunity for you to be an enlightened citizen. Join us on Tuesday, big day, right here in the chapel. We're going to be doing a prayer vigil for peace for our country throughout the entire day. Practitioners are going to be here praying. We invite you to join us, hold the space, knowing the high watch that there's just peace for our country. This is a nonpartisan event from nine to five. And then at five o'clock, our Zoom room will open for anybody online or anybody that can't make it here that would like to join. And then on Wednesday, if you're looking for a little more support, we'll be here from nine to noon. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks so much. We invite you now to stand for the benediction and peace song. Please repeat after me. Something wonderful is happening through me right now. It is this thing called life. Life is in my mind. Life is in my body. Life is all I am. I'm an enlightened citizen. Thank you, life. And so it is.